Given that you've had to suffer through a couple of rather long lectures over the past few weeks in the last several learning units, I think it's about time that you get a break. And so this week's learning units, uh, actually the lecture should prove to be pretty short. This, um, this week we're looking at social work from a more macro level and the kinds of roles that social workers play in doing such things as in chapter 22 developing and maintaining healthy communities both where they live and where their clients live. The chapter starts out with a, a discussion about the uh, heat wave in Chicago in 1995 when I believe over 700 people died even in an age where air conditioning was widely available throughout the entire United States to most individuals. Still the most vulnerable, vulnerable of our populations, the elderly, the poor, um, and populations such as this may not be able to afford the electricity bill that comes with the resources or may have a broken air conditioner or no air conditioner at all. And those are the individuals that suffer sometimes when, when they're at the most really when, when the larger community has particular problems such as this. One resident in Chicago at the time described the city as a shooting gallery and said that it was just safer to stay inside even under these horribly, horribly oppressive conditions. Even today, Chicago is, is known to be um, a, a very troubled city, even with the president um, living in Chicago or having come from Chicago. Uh, last year, there was a story of a shooting of a young person, I believe a mile or so away from his own home. And so Chicago is one community that, that has trouble, and there, there are many others around the United States. The interesting thing, uh, New York City, for instance, at least if you believe what you read in the press, um, has really made quite a bit of turnaround in terms of its own safety factors and and uh, some of that has to do with some things that the mayor's office instituted uh, and some of those things are not very popular including I believe what's called stop and frisk where officers are able to just uh, stop people that look suspicious. Once again of course the individuals who tend to be stopped the most are individuals with, from minority populations and um, and so there, there are many many uh, controversies about that and yet there is at least some indication that that different kinds of things that that government and management might do um, and the population might do can change the tenor of a city even a very large city such as New York itself this um, particular slide talks about um, Salibi who in 1996 wrote a document has said that he believed that in communities that amplify individual resilience there is awareness recognition and the use of assets of most members of the community this, this is that there are both formal and informal networks of of support and and instruction and encouragement in those communities in other words you know people are positively engaged with each other uh, and don't kind of just keep to themselves and and uh, don't allow negative things to go on around them so the the um, thinking here is is that really this social work really needs to be involved in the development of healthy communities because there are many things that uh, can be done that uh, can be avoided and and as I was mentioning earlier it is oftentimes our clients who are the ones who suffer the most from difficulties in communities some model communities uh, have a, a type of a social connectedness and a sense of virtue and civic pride and social responsibility uh, unlike uh, much of the traditional group dynamics where uh, individuals in a group uh, allow others to take responsibility for things in, in, a, in, a, in a positive environment of a community uh, individuals are willing to step up and to take responsibility to change things and to improve their improve their neighborhoods and their communities and they connect with each other in ways that uh, individuals have have been loath to connect in 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 recent years as as industrialization has increased you know this is kind of a basic sociology um, context you know that uh, this this notion of Gesellschaft and Gemeinschaft and one being a a very impersonal community and the other being a very personal connected community and as industrialization has increased over the last 150 years our communities have moved from the personal kind of communities where uh, everybody looks out for everybody else to the more impersonal societies where you, you may not even know your neighbors and forgive me if I've already given you this example but um, 
in in the community where I grew up, which is a small town in central Pennsylvania, uh, the the individuals that lived on my street corner actually lived in these homes literally for generations and grandparents lived down the street from from their grandchildren and the parents lived just around the corner and uh, if if somebody if one of the parents went away for a day or something like that everybody in the neighborhood kind of knew it and kept an eye on the kids that were there left behind and um, everybody kind of looked out for each other more or less and and uh, not that not that uh, there was a lot of people sitting down and having dinner together or anything like that on that kind of a level but but everybody was mutually supportive and and my mom and dad knew that everybody on that corner pretty much had the same values that they had and if they didn't they knew what those, the differences were flash forward another 20 or 30 years when I'm living in 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 the, really the first time I lived in a city was in central Florida in Orlando it's a relatively small city but nonetheless uh, I lived in an apartment building with uh, eight units uh, in in one entryway basically four downstairs four upstairs and and um, in all of the six years that I lived in that apartment building I never met any of my neighbors and and never was inside any of those apartments nor were they even though we had um, a community swimming pool right behind our own building and so that's the difference in in uh, and, and certainly I'm as responsible for that as anyone else I but I'm just making the um, the comment about this because it points out the differences of how communities can be together and and uh, the writings in this particular chapter talk about the more personal people connect the more intimately people connect with each other in any community they become aware of the issues that the community um, um, faces and can really kind of address them together with some sensitivity for each other so there is there there tends to be a discussion and a dialogue that uh, not only addresses particular problems but maybe you know begins to develop some public policies and things that that really gets the agreement and consensus of everybody in that community so much of our existence today seems to be centered around at least in terms of community and larger levels of, around partisan politics and you know the left fighting with the right and and these things uh, you know as the author points out I believe just aren't necessary certainly on a local level that that it is very possible to to be to get to know each other and be connected and work together for for change that benefits everybody Robert and Lee, uh, no, uh, not Robert E. Lee, Robert and Lee suggested that there were three indicators of healthy communities that relate directly to individual health. And this is first the, the positive physical environment where where it is a relatively quiet thing. There isn't a lot of traffic going on. There's there's proper, proper lighting uh, at night so that nobody is afraid to walk down the street uh, and those kinds of things. And so, um, so, um, this says other features of a community that may lead to functional loss in older adults, and I know that's that's not correct. I I went through these slides and tried to fix these things before, but uh, missed that one. But anyway, the the physical environment and the social environment where there is a, a low crime rate, at least, if not a total absence of, of crime, and and a, the, a sense of uh, having a safe community where the resources you need are close by, and then a service environment that is. Uh, uh, rich and provides access to to things like transportation and uh, for seniors you know available senior centers and for children perhaps you know family centers and and teen centers and things like that so that that um, you know so that really individuals in the community uh, can can have what they need right there at their fingertips looking at, at elderly adults in particular there's some studies about um, elderly adults um, in pre-disaster signs of depression and and one of the things that it points out here is is that you know if if uh, an elderly person has social support um, they're, they're they're less likely to be depressed to begin with but those who are cut off from support say because of the death of a spouse or or having their friends leave or something like this are more are more likely to uh, be vulnerable to increases in depression at, at, at t particularly in times of stress and, and and those kinds of things and so elderly adults um, who had higher levels of social support had lower levels of depression before and after natural disasters in most studies 
we're looking at air pollution and, and um, another thing that, that it certainly impacts the quality of life and community and and here the statistics from about 10 years ago indicate that children who live in polluted, uh, polluted communities are much more likely to have a uh, loss of lung function, significant loss of lung function than would be expected for their age. And, and uh, whether it's driving cars or it's fossil fuels that are generating the electricity that we use, these things deplete our environment and, and uh, impact our, you know, our health for really for our entire lifetime. And so there is, uh, there is uh, a distinct reason why we should be concerned about our environment and, and um, think about conservation all of the time. And I, and I understand also that the um, the environment in Los Angeles has improved in the last 10 years or so uh, through some concerted efforts to reduce pollution. But here the statistic shows that 50% of the summer days have pollution readings of 100 to 150, which really w would seriously affect children with, uh, with asthma. Traffic congestion, congestion is another thing that reduces the quality of life. Um, I can remember one of the things, in fact, that uh, helped me to decide to leave Central Florida and to, well, to move to Alaska actually was um, the city was, was growing so much and not so much even the city, but the whole metropolitan area of the city in Central Florida. And it would, to get five or six miles down an interstate highway at rush hour, it would take me 35 to 40 minutes at night, each night, sitting in traffic on the interstate and barely moving. And... Um, them telling us, the, the traffic planners telling us that uh, for the next 10 or 20 years, uh, the individuals who commuted during regular peak uh, transportation hours uh, should should make sure they got a car with a good air conditioner and a good stereo system because they were going to be spending a lot of time in those cars. And that was enough to tell me it was probably time to find some other place to live. Uh, and here you see some statistics that talk about uh, the, the hours and hours of delay and the cost it is to us for the delay in sitting in traffic. Uh, and it, it's something like $3,000 per driver and lost wages and, 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 and wasted fuel, I guess, in a year even is what this talks about. And, uh, of course, um, you know, if you're familiar with things like road rage and things like this, uh, congestion, traffic congestion, uh, tends to increase assaults and dangerous drivings, heart attacks, uh, strokes, and all of those kinds of things just because of the stress involved in the traffic. Um, learning how to relax when you're sitting in a long line of traffic wanting to get somewhere is a, definitely a higher level skill. The violent crime nationally has shown a decrease since the peak years of the 1980s into the 1990s, but while the frequency of violence uh, seems to have decreased and it's very possible that um, there have been some changes in how the statistics regarding violent crime is recorded and so as you digest this information about the decrease in violent crime I would also encourage you if this is something that you um, are very interested in to dig a little deeper and make sure that there haven't been changes in how violent crime is recorded and reported even by federal uh, agencies because leadership has a investment an investment in convincing us that our nation is doing better under their under their watch and so uh, sometimes just simple little tweaks in, in what is defined as a violent crime or not or what is reported and what is not can impact these statistics. One of the things that I believe continues to be the case is that domestic violence, uh, that is violence between uh, people living together, uh, even when police are involved, are not necessarily reported to the, uh, to the United States um, Crime Indexing Service, what NCIS, I believe, is the it, the service that that collects this data, and I believe domestic cases, domestic violence, still aren't included in in violence violence statistics for the nation. Crime statistics now that could have changed, but that's my understanding of this at least. So that's this an example of how whether those things are included or not can really impact them what the statistics show. Even if our crime rate is decreasing, violent crime is, is decreasing, the severity of the violence, according to this slide at least, uh, uh, tends to be increasing and also that the individuals, both victims and perpetrators of the violent crime, tend to be getting younger and younger.
And there are those that have a lot of theories about why this would be the case. And many people point to the, the same thing we were talking about a week or two ago, the, about the weakening of traditional socializing institutions in our community, the family, the school system, churches, and those kinds of things, that the citizens just uh, aren't growing up with this uh, with this encouragement and modeling they need in order to get along and to learn how to settle conflicts in a healthy fashion. So what can we do about about this to, to improve our communities? Well, one of the things that social workers do is, of course, advocacy, and, and this is the help provided by workers and others to assist individuals and groups uh, with um, with whatever it is that they have going on, whatever kind of process is going on. Community organization is a bit different from that, and this, this uh, uh, involves um, using techniques to, to bring about change. For instance, protest, and there's some examples, you know, rallies, marches, demonstrations, and those kinds of things, boycotts perhaps, uh, and political action, which sometimes, you know, it's the get out the vote thing, you know, getting people to vote or lobbying individuals in the legislature, writing to your congressman, those kinds of things. I mean, you can do uh, writing letters to the editor. These are things you can do on an individual level, and social workers can do it on an individual level, and, and also you can encourage, as a professional, we can encourage our our clients to to gather together and do these things as well. So community organization is uh, is is really a, a form of social work on a larger level that's very important, I think, in bringing about change to communities. And there's different kinds of community organization here that that you can see that's listed, whether it be community building. Um, or uh, social action to uh, advocate for change in social institutional policies or how power is uh, distributed in the community. Social planning, which tends to look at uh, the future and, and uh, kind of perhaps more taken more of the traditional approach in terms of working with government and large uh, bureaucracies to, to develop a better plan for the future, so to speak. Radical social work is um, Another thing that isn't quite so popular these days, uh, in, in the 1950s and 1960s in particular during the civil rights era, this became a much more popular uh, form of intervention for social workers. And in fact, there were even some schools of social work that called themselves schools of radical social work. And, and, and really, uh, there have been um, social change. Some of the great times of social change, as this slide points out, such as the progressive era uh, in the early uh, 20th century, you know, 1910 to 1925, perhaps in that area, um, even during the New Deal years and after that, uh, the changes in the 1960s. There, there were there was, you know, some really kind of very active, active kind of demonstrations and 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 pushes for change. Uh, upon, from the social work community and those individuals that they're working with. Sometimes this radical uh, action has resulted in some kind of violent actions and things and uh, by the social advocate at activists and and of course you know that that um, for a number of different reasons is something that I um, I think would have to be you know reserved for, for very extreme circumstances because um, bringing about you know violence in, 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 a, in a community certainly can can create some change but can also have a lot of very negative impacts that uh, you know upon upon the worker as well as the community individuals that are in that community so uh, but uh, there there certainly have been um, many movements of a more radical nature in the social work profession among those uh, activists who advocate for change uh, in our history and it's another type of change that can come about but in the long run we don't really know whether that outcome is going to be good or bad and uh, I think that's sort of the point here of, of mentioning this. And so um, that's it for this particular chapter and I hope that um, this explains these hits the high points of the chapter at least effectively for you. If you've got questions or comments about this, please do contact me. Thank you.